I have no disclosure of the first conflict of interest uh, related to this presentation. Uh, my research funding uh, for my translational research portfolio is from the NIH. I'm very fortunate to have been funded by the NIH for the last 20 years, and uh, currently we also have uh, uh, support from the National Science Foundation. Uh, my, my clinical outcomes research is clinical trials, and uh, this is a large study we just published uh, recently on the New England Journal of Medicine, so that's uh, part of my uh, research portfolio. So today's seminar, um, I would like to briefly tell you who, who I am to give you just brief background, you know, my biases in this field, um, talk about this exciting new space uh, is creating uh, around uh, digital transformation in, in surgery, which is my, my field. Talk about context awareness in not just surgery, but complex social technical systems in general. And talk about also interoperability, which is now a big, big topic. It's a US law, you will see. And then leave some time for discussion. All right, so this is me uh, in my office. This is an operating room. That's what it looks like. I'm, I'm a practicing heart surgeon in Boston, Massachusetts, a city known for strong sports allegiances, and we, we train our youngs from young age to hate the New York Yankees, as you can see. And this is my office, uh, the operating room. Um, always, this is a, the depiction that you see um, as a, you know, a, like a temple, like a like a church or a synagogue. In reality, this is a complex and highly vul vulnerable and highly consequential socio-technical system. You'll see a little bit. Um, I had the good fortune of being involved in a very exciting period for my specialty in general for surgery uh, in the last 30 years. And my experience with robotic surgery goes back, believe it or not, almost 30 years. Uh, in 1994, um, we were among the first to use uh, the ESOP uh, voice-activated robotic system by Computer in Motion, uh, a company that was founded, as most of you know, know probably, by Yulong Wang, a, a PhD student of uh, Takeo Kanade in, at the Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, who went on to found Computer in Motion. And this uh, was F the first FDA-approved ro robotic system in the U.S. in 1994. And then I had a good fortune to be, um, to uh, gain the clinical experience with both systems that were FDA approved, um, the computer motion Zeus system, which is now um, not uh, in operation anymore, and then more recently the, the Da Vinci system from Intuitive Surgical, and also performed the first um, beating heart robotic coronary bypass surgery in the US in the year 2000. I also, Funded a research lab, medical robotics, and computer assisted surgery. This is the website. The mission of our lab is to support, improve, and develop human performance in surgery. We also uh, was fortunate to get across path with some of the giants in the field. One is sitting right here um, in a very exciting time for robotics. Um, in, uh, in the early 2000, a new field was being created uh, um, called biorobotics, and um, Alon uh, was actually recipient of the best paper award for our work in um, the first biorob uh, conference in 2006 in Pisa, organized by our friend Paolo Dario. That was really when all this kind of bio inspiration started to, to take shape. and. Um, the system that we have had something to do with the bottom center, like a snake robot, but uh, uh, you'll see that there's, uh, um, nature has continued to inspire a lot of the work around this field. Um, again, I, I was lucky to cross paths with very smart people, and you know, one of the results was we were issued a patent on, on the steerable follow the leaders snake robot or hyper redundant. Um, system um, with uh, how we chose it and Alan Wolf and and uh, we actually as, as Alan uh, mentioned we also took it all the way to translational into a, a formula company it's called Med Robotics. I also was involved 
um, with other um, projects. This is another bio-inspired robot, an inchworm robot in this case. It was um, featured on the New York Times uh, science page on Tuesdays, if you read the New York Times. <laughs> and, and this actually, we published this in, back in 2006. It's one of the first semi-autonomous robotic systems. You may know that autonomous robotic surgery is all the rage now. Um, robots basically performing parts or the entire procedure autonomously without direct control with the surgeon. So we, we actually anticipated this trend way back. Um, and this was a publication in circulation. So this is about me, give you some background. So I'm, I'm a surgeon who had interested in innovation and, and, and minimal invasive surgery. And, you know, just to give you a perspective, surgery is considered one of the most challenging activities performed by humans. And specifically in my field, it takes uh, um, approximately in an academic hospital in the United States about 12 years after medical school to train, to be a fully trained cardiac surgeon. So I cannot think of another field any field that takes so long to train a human. So that tells you that there, there is a lot of complexity, perhaps it's the way we, we train each other, and maybe an uh, outdated apprenticeship model perhaps needs some updating, but this is the way it is. So most cardiac surgeons enter practice independently past the age of 35. So, And surgery, if you go back, um, 19th century transition to 20th century uh, was more of art form back then. Um, you know, this, you know, figures uh, of uh, giants in surgery that basically commanded, uh, you know, respect and, and admiration from from a crowd. To what was now uh, a cooperative environments where we value teams over individuals, and uh, where. We are now flooded, literally, uh, with technology in the operating room and information and data. And this is leading to a situation like this one, where I'm in the operating room performing robotic surgery. I'm trying to uh, interrogate information on a monitor, which is hidden behind the arms of the Vinci robot. Uh, there's a Harlan machine in front of me. And this has been <laughs> actually dubbed a spaghetti syndrome, because we're we're, we're getting to the point where this is overwhelming to, um, to healthcare providers to work in this type of environment. And then we are surprised that the, we have errors and mistakes. Well, well we design environments that are really not suitable for, uh, for safety and error-free performance. And so we get into the point where, like other complex socio-technical systems, uh, humans are less and less involved in the big picture operations. You know, an Airbus uh, 380 uh, is run by a pilot and a co-pilot. There's no flight engineers anymore. Uh, it's all computers. And, and there, there's still human in the loop, of course. Um, most, most of us probably would not like to fly on a plane without a pilot. But the role is, is, is more of a coordination and overseeing and, uh, and, and it's um, um, a system where the complexity uh, is uh, got to the point where a, a human could not manage flying a plane or a team of humans. And this has something to do with a fundamental issue related to our brain. This is a um, slide representing uh, the cognitive workload on the x-axis and performance in any field on the y-axis. This applies to medicine, surgery, uh, military, um, aviation. And you can see that uh, when you cross a certain threshold, where you go into so-called red zone, uh, your brain, brain starts to um, lose uh, performance. And that's where you go into error space. And, and this is what well known in uh, other complex socio-technical systems where basically error is considered uh, normal. And uh, like nuclear plants, they basically all plan around human errors, how to handle 
errors, because errors will be made if there is a human in the mix. So it's just part of human nature. So what is now happening, similar to what is now the design of modern aircrafts, is kind of moving into a different type of, of, of um, system organization in procedure rooms, uh, operating rooms in general, where we have uh, uh, area of sensors, we have domain knowledge, uh, we have effectors, and we have patients, and we're, we're, we're trying to kind of create a, a system that is uh, um, more integrated than it is currently. So I'm going to introduce what is now referred to as surgical data science. This is something that may be new to you, but is uh, emerging and moving very, very fast, becoming mainstream. And this is a new scientific dis discipline with the objective of improving the quality of interventional healthcare, so primarily surgery and then all high complex interventions, uh, and through the capture, organization, analysis, and modeling of data. And this is interesting, you know, it, it crosses right in your field. Most of you are engineers, computer scientists, so the disciplines that intersect with this new space of surgical data science are machine learning, image processing, computer vision, robotics, um, simulation, natural language processing, and, and so on. These are all the tools that are being used um, uh, from a software standpoint. And uh, you see there a list, a partial list of tools relevant to data acquisition, access and storage, communication in surgical data science. And you see Amazon um, Clouds is one of the uh, primary um, providers of cloud computing and, and others moving into the space. But as you know, data is, uh, is only valuable if it's quality data. So if you have garbage going into systems and then you have garbage coming out. So there is a booming field of uh, annotations uh, of this data sets. And uh, this is mostly managed by human workforces. This company I listed here is only a partial list. And most of them are located, guess where? Silicon Valley, the Boston area, and India. They're seeing this as a big potential opportunity for business. Uh, the market for AI and machine learning relevant to data preparation solutions is growing to 1.2 billion by the end of next year, according to some estimates. So this, um, because data preparation and engineering tasks represent 80% of the consume of the time consumed by most AI machine learning projects. So that's where the human is, um, is still required. So human in the loop is not going away anytime soon, particularly for data labeling and AI quality control. And there's a growing repository of data that are annotated, that are being shared worldwide to advance the research. These are uh, procedures, uh, mostly endoscopic procedures, let's say gallbladder removal using an endoscope, fully annotated that are sh shared with common language and, and data that are moving forward uh, this field. So this is just to give you a flavor of what is happening in surgery, and this is uh, keep an eye on this uh, space, digital, surgery, surgical data science, because uh, it's, it's going to be transformative in this area. So let's move on to a little bit of another concept, which is context awareness in, in general, complex socio-technical systems. So if you believe, like I do, and we can go into more details, but that's for another conversation, that human errors are fundamentally mental workload problems. So. Uh, and, and this is related to knowledge from uh, neuropsychology, uh, the fact that uh, our species, Homo sapiens, um, developed and became the dominant species on Earth through a feature that our brain has, which is to value new information um, as much as like animals value food. So we're, our brain is constantly seeking for new information. That's why we have a very small size, uh, short-term memory, in order to allow us to continuously scan the environment for new information. So this is 
a blessing, but it's also a curse. And this book, uh, if you're interested, uh, tells you the story uh, from Adam Ghazali at UCSF. Uh, ancient brains in a high-tech world. Today, this problem is potentially a curse because they were with over uh, supply of information, um, especially in the worst time when we are flying a plane, uh, managing a nuclear plant, or, or doing open heart surgery. And so our, all these new streams of information actually are interfering with the primary task. So this is for a additional um, questions if you have it. But if you believe like me that human errors are mental workload problems, then Complex socio-technical systems, they need to uh, look at ways to monitor the humans in the, in the loop. And uh, as you know, uh, autonomous vehicles are the development and, and the, the introduction is really um, uh, the limiting factor is, is the human. If we had a traffic scenario where the only autom autonomous vehicles would be on the roads, there would be probably zero accidents, most likely. But having mixed autonomous and human uh, uh, driving vehicles, uh, that's a problem. And so what uh, is the cutting edge uh, work in, from car companies uh, worldwide is basically manage and account for uh, in-vehicle distractions. And in order to capture distraction as they happen, you see that uh, you have uh, these vehicles now uh, fitted with context-aware interaction technology. You see the um, um, haptic sensors, uh, wearable devices, camera, computer vision, managing uh, eye gaze, etc. So this is what's happening at the cutting edge of safety, of transportation, and many other complex socio-technical systems. So back to healthcare, there is a new field also. Um, developing that is referred to as ambient intelligence. So this is our passive contactless sensors embedded in the hospital environment. And they can they are, be aware of people. People could be a patient, but could also be healthcare providers, movements, and they can adapt to their continued needs. So this is not science fiction, this is today. This system and ambient intelligence can uh, monitor and um, measure and uh, improve performance for clinical activities, uh, count air personnel, estimate the duration of activities, uh, and there's potential um, opportunities in this field that are really uh, untapped. Uh, if you're interested in looking into this uh, topic, I refer to this Nature publication um, a couple of years ago. So my research actually is pretty much the only that I'm aware of who are kind of looking at doing this um, in the operating room. So we have basically created our operating room as a laboratory, and we're aiming to create an ambient intelligence uh, um, using sensors, primarily non-contact wireless sensors, um, audio, video, um, and other sensors. So this is the picture I showed you earlier. And none of you noticed, but I'm wearing a strange kind of box. Um, and that is a, a Mindware um, ECG lead system that is designed to capture and relay wirelessly information on heart rate variability, which is one of the measures of cognitive workload. Not only that, we are also using um, near infrared spectroscopy. Uh, if you see under my surgical cap, there are two patches there. In this case, they're not wireless. Um, they're wired uh, to a monitoring system. And we have actually been the first to show in the literature a correlation between central nervous system through near infrared spectroscopy and peripheral nervous system through our reviability measures of team uh, physiological workload. Um, i give you one application, for instance, of this. So as I told you, um, we're seeking information all the time. And, and the exchange of information within the team actually is critical in order to uh, optimize safety of the patient. The problem is 
when is the right time to exchange information, especially if you're doing a very complex part of the procedure. I'm uh, connecting a millimeter-sized blood vessel on the heart of the patient, and that's, you know, there's no margin for error. So if I were to be interrupted because there is some information that needs to be shared with me at that time, that would have an high cost. That interruption, which is well-meaning to provide me new information on the patient status, let's say, is ill-timed. And the timing during that phase means that it will take me away, my brain, short-term memory, from my primary task, sewing the blood vessel, to attend to the new information. I cannot do the two things at the same time, neither you can. Uh, we cannot multitask, believe it or not. We can only switch from primary task to secondary task, then go back to the primary task. What's the problem with this? When you go back to the primary task, your short memory has been erased. And so you're like, okay, now let's go back to where were we? That's, that's human nature, it's just how our brain works. So what are we doing? We are able to monitor and correlate to the phases of procedure the peaks and valleys of our cognitive workload. So when we're busy, busy sewing a blood vessel, our cognitive load has a peak. When we are like done, tying the knot, we take a deep breath, then our cognitive workload is at the bottom. That is when you have a very low cost of exchanging information. So this is a system that we have uh, developed, published, um, disclosed to our technology transfer office, we call Intelligent Interruption System. And this has application potentially not just in surgery, but also in other complex socio-technical systems. So you start seeing a trend here that a lot of the errors that we make are because we kind of don't, don't connect the dots of information that we already have, but they are potentially can transformational in terms of uh, simple fixes that uh, could uh, uh, improve the safety. And we are currently, this next week, um, performing simulation. We have a large simulation environment where we're simulating uh, this exact uh, type of uh, approach uh, uh, in, in surgery. This is another, for instance, uh, information that we are not collecting. We are, we are collecting sound level in the operating room throughout procedure. We have a, a large uh, data sets of, of surgical procedure from beginning to end, multiple hours, hundreds of hours. And we have also the background sound among many other streams of information. So you may say, well, who cares? Well, it turns out that ambient sound um, drops in phases where there is a team cognitive workload to the peak. That's probably because people can really naturally understand that uh, these are phases where um, you should really kind of uh, focus 100% on the task um, um, and, and basically um, not uh, talk about anything else. There's like a sterile cockpit equivalent, but we don't have it in surgery. Um, so. This is potentially another surrogate a type of uh, uh, information stream that uh, may tell us something about the state of the team and how the procedure is progressing. So we're just uh, touching the surface here of the information that we're having. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna just move uh, uh, forward here. This is a recent review that we published on um, IEEE Transaction and Medical Robotics on computer vision in the operating room. So this is, uh, um, Again, a, a way to uh, correlate uh, procedure phase, and you already had um, most of the information uh, from Professor Rivling talks earlier from Verily. You saw that critical uh, views of safety uh, can be monitored and, uh, and confirmed, and you can actually have instruments like uh, this uh, grasper or a stapler being recognized by the computer vision system and correlated to the phases. You can also um, understand uh, you know, what is the remaining procedure time. And so this allows basically context awareness in complex procedures. This is another application. This is just using a open source uh, computer vision system where all the team members are labeled, tracked across procedures and uh, 
and we're making inferences on this information. This is this information that is not collected by anybody anywhere in the world. My lab is really kind of the only one doing this type of work. And you may wonder why, because I think this is the natural evolution of what we do in surgery. We should, you know, record every single procedure, have the information available for researchers to move the field forward. These are some challenges that we discussed in our paper. I'm going to skip in the interest of time and talk briefly to the end of my talk on interoperability. So this is just common definition. The ability of two or more systems to exchange health information and use the information once it is received. And, and there is an ecosystem, of course, which uh, comprises the individual systems and processes that want to share, exchange, and access all form of health information. So you may say, who cares? Well, um, this is the new model with, uh, with um, Apologies to Thomas Jefferson, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and the Declaration of Independence. Um, but now, one of the inalienable rights of humans, if you live in the United States, is not only the right to life, liberty, but also of health equity. And this is a, a big push um, to improve and, uh, the healthcare system in the U.S., decrease the waste, and the belief is through the, the government uh, in the United States, Office of National Coordination for Health Information Technology, is to set the data loose. The idea is to provide consumers, patients, with access to their own data immediately after it is acquired and establish trust in a partnership. So, um, and uh, um, this is US law. As of April 2021, blocking patients from their own health records is against the law in the United States. It may result in fines for hospitals and doctors. So the hospitals don't want to get fined. So all of a sudden now, uh, if you go to see a doctor in the United States, you have within minutes of having a test of a procedure, data sent to you or a link to access the, your own data for the first time ever. And the idea is to promote basically better outcome, lower the cost, and change healthcare. So this is an important trend. I'm not going to go into details, but there are opportunities here for standards to develop and, uh, and, um, and, and, uh, and new commercial opportunities to, uh, to flourish. So within in complex socio-technical systems, I'll give you one example to just hopefully I'll wake you up with this one. You're familiar with the plane. We all probably got here by plane, and, and, and planes have landing gear. But once you take off, well, yet there's no use uh, for landing gear, so the landing gear is retracted until you're ready for, uh, for the descent and then landing, when you are going to need it, uh, for sure. So the, in transportation, there is mandatory kind of uh, uh, landing gear panel uh, control system that tells you if the landing gear is up or down, so there is no confusion because it's kind of a important thing to have the landing gear when you need it, okay? So if you're with me with this, uh, you know, I'll introduce you to cardiac surgery 101. So this is the ventilator. That's how when the patient is anesthetized, we maintain vital functions uh, through breathing, exchange of oxygen, CO2. And then this is the other part that made cardiac surgery uh, possible is the heart lung machine. This was introduced in 1953 at Thomas Jefferson Hospital in Philadelphia by John Gibbon. Before that, you, you had to operate where the heart was beating and was considered not possible to do surgery on the heart. And then the heart on machine allowed us to stop the heart. So open heart surgery became available and there was a big boom in my specialty, but it's thanks to the use of the heart lung machine. So ventilator, heart lung machine. So when you start the uh, heart lung machine, the function of the lung is provided by the our lung machine, so you don't need a ventilator anymore. It's like now you took off and now you're cruising, you don't need the landing gear. The ventilator is the landing gear. You're with me? So what happens uh, is that in order to restart the heart, 
you have to now go through a sequence which involves um, activating the ventilator, uh, stopping the Maharla machine, and then there's three team members that need to communicate. And there's uh, nothing that connects physically the ventilator with the Harla machine. You may say why, but that's why we have an issue with interoperability. So there is a complication which is considered a never event, should never happen. It's like you should never land without the landing gear, which is failing to resume the ventilator upon weaning the patient from the Harla machine. And this, unless it's recognized promptly, will result in either brain uh, death or a stroke or, or just death. And it's absolutely preventable. So briefly, we decided that we want to do something about this. And we went back to the lab. I am in Boston. You know, if I, had, if I were in Israel, I would probably go to Alon or some friends at Technion. You know, in Boston, you just, same thing. You, you, you'll find the world expert next door, in your office next door. So I went to a friend of mine who's a world expert in, in interoperability. And he said, well, let's, uh, let's figure out a system. Well, the first thing you have to do is, like, which standards are you going to use? This is a partial list of the interoperability standards used today. Partial list. So you have to pick one, and there are pros and cons of each one. And uh, this is the one that my friend in Boston chose. But if I had asked the same question to Alon or somebody in Germany, they probably have picked a different standards, so just to tell you how. And this is uh, the ICE. Uh, um, uh, which is a vendor agnostic, um, flexible interoperability architecture for um, uh, patient-centric uh, care in diverse clinical environments. So it, it works in the ward, uh, in the ICU, or in the operating room. And this is our uh, information on how the system is work. And that's the standard. So this is the open eyes. So this is our... Um, implementation of the standard that I just uh, showed you uh, for our purposes. Um, and you see medical devices uh, connected through adapters, um, through a open eyes supervisors. This is, by the way, is freely available online. And basically, we configured a, um, an application for uh, the Harlem machine, one for the ventilator. And to make a long story short, we wrote a simple um, rule uh, that says if the system, the system will sound an alert um, when the bypass pump flow and the anesthesia machine uh, ventilator are both zero. That's how we came up with our safety solution. And, uh, and this is a paper that we presented a few years ago at Mikai, and we got the best uh, paper award. Um, but it, it seems like obvious that, you know, if we're flying a plane, we should f get a system where we don't forget to, to, um, to lower the landing gear. And, and here we're doing open-air surgery every day across the world uh, without that safety net. So this is, tells you how interoperability, I think, I think is, is, a, is an urgent challenge. Uh, it's hampered by uh, issues um, that I was not aware before I got into the field, and, and there are many standards out there. Um, so this, of course, led to uh, other challenges, which is ma managing data streams. Uh, um, and so we are now, and this is just to give you this, this final slide. This is our overall vision for a surgical environment where we monitor team members uh, for, um, and we have, make inferences on their non-technical skills. Some of the things that you saw early this morning were about uh, technical skills. And so, to be a surgeon, you have to have uh, technical, sewing, uh, cutting, and non-technical skills. What are non-technical skills? Like uh, decision-making, ability to work with others in a team, um, a leadership, uh, communication. Those are non-technical skills. If you ask most surgeons, they will tell you 70% of surgery is non-technical skills. So, we are managing cognitive workload ability to uh, work as a team, uh, and, and we're putting this information uh, in, um, in apps, uh, and, um, and this is our you know, work that is funded by the NIH toward the 
open eye centered context that we are operating room. I'm going to just, uh, last slide, um, probably some of you know Kevin Cleary. Um, in 2004, he convened a OR of the future. He said, well, let's, let's, let's talk about what the OR should look in 2020, which was two years ago, by the way. And it's interesting to look at this. And the recommendation from this paper um, where we need uh, better integration of technologies in a common set of standards, working on it, improvements in electronic medical record and access to information in the operating room, uh, interoperability of equipment, they said it back then, um, lack of ontology or standards for high quality surgical informatic systems, and the need to, for clear understanding of surgical workflow, still working on it. So a lot of these visions were still valid today. We have made some progress, that's why my talk was toward um, a goal. It's an aspiration. We, we still have work to do, but I think uh, if we continue to, to have conferences like this where you have, you have surgeons kind of bringing here real, real problems, I'm sure we can find a solution. And thank you very much.